Personal finance practice problem using OneNote. Preferred stock, current yield, and price calculation. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. You're not required to, but if you have access to OneNote, would like to follow along, we're in the icon left-hand side, Practice Problems tab in the 12260 Preferred Stock, Current Yield, and Price Calculation tab. Also, take a look at the Immersive Reader tool, the Practice Problems, typically in the text area too, with the same name, same number, but with transcripts. Transcripts that can be translated into multiple languages and either listened to or read in them. We're now thinking about investment in preferred stock, which is a little bit different, a little bit more unusual, a bit more exotic than our other investments, because usually we think about investments as two main categories, either fixed income, usually the bonds, or the equities, typically the common stock. The preferred stock actually falls kind of somewhere in the middle. Technically, it's on the equities side of things, but functionally, it acts more like a bonds type of investment, which actually makes it a little bit easier to think about in some ways, although it's far less common to invest in the preferred stock than in, say, the common stock, because again, normally we're either investing in, say, bonds, for example, or the common stock. So the reason the preferred stock is kind of more on the equity side is because when you think about the corporation, for example, that it, say we're giving money to the corporation for a bond versus preferred stock, if we're buying preferred stock from the company, then they're going to be receiving cash and the other side's going to be in the equity section, kind of like the common stock, but now in the preferred stock section of the equity, which represents basically the ownership interest of the assets of the corporation. Whereas if they were to distribute bonds, if we bought bonds from a company, they would get the cash and the other side would be a liability recorded in the liability section. The reason preferred stocks are preferred is not because they're better than the common stocks, but they have certain pros and cons related to the preferred stock. The preferred component is typically that the payments for the preferred stock, the dividends, are more standard, they're more set, and usually they have to be paid before the common stock. That's why they're preferred. They're going to be paid first. They also have the benefit of if there was a default, if the company went bankrupt, then the preferred stockholders in theory get paid before the common stockholders when they pay out in accordance to the liquidation process. However, the bondholders get paid before the preferred stockholders. So the preferred stock kind of acts more like a bond in that you're going to get these series of payments that are fairly guaranteed into the future, although not as guaranteed as the bonds, because if they don't pay the bonds, then you actually default on the bonds and that's a big problem for the corporations, but a fairly constant stream and certain stream of income into the future. Now, remember with the bonds, the fixed income side of things, then you usually have the future cash flows that we're gonna value the bonds for. And that's gonna be a series of interest payments, like an annuity that we can discount. And then we've got the maturity of the bond that we can discount to the present value. The preferred stock is gonna be a series of basically preferred dividends that will be kind of uniform going out into the future, but there's no end point to them. So they kind of go out indefinitely into the future. We don't have the maturity date and we don't have that, that lump sum amount at the point of maturity. Okay, so given that, we can tr try to value the preferred stock in a similar way that we can value the bonds. And it's easier to do so than with the common stock because with the common stock, we have a little bit more complexity because the dividends might vary more than they would with a preferred stock and because we also have the other kind of form of growth that we're going to have which would be the increase in the value of the stock price there's not so much fluctuation in the value of the preferred stock price it's going to act more kind of like a, a bond because you're paying for the future stream of income in essence as opposed to paying for the increase in the value of the company as a whole represented by the common stock okay so we're going to say the par value is 300 the yield at the time of issuance is 12. The current market price is 240. So the and the market rate is going to be 15%. So if we're going to calculate the current yield, we could say the annual dividend payment is going to be $300 times the yield at the time of issuance, which would probably be equal to the market rate at the point of issuance and possibly changing as time passes 12%. That means it's going to be having an annual dividend payment of 300 times 12% or 0.12 of 36. If we take that and compare it to the current market price, 
which uh, we're going to say is the 240. So that's what it's, they're trading for. Then 36 divided by 240 is the 15%. So 36 divided by the 240 market price is the 15% current yield. The yield, remember, is typically calculated on a yearly basis. And that's the thing that we can use to compare to other types of investments of a similar uh, type of nature to see which would be best. Now let's go ahead and try to calculate. We're going to get back to this 240, calculating the price, assuming that we have the current yield, which we're going to say, for example, would be the market yield that we can get on other similar type of investments. And let's say the annual dividend was the $36. And we can use our present value of future payments to get back to the 240, the market price in a similar way as the bonds. Remember on the bonds, there's two cash flow streams that we looked at in the future. One is the series of interest payments, which is fixed. And the other is the present value of the amount at maturity that we're going to be receiving kind of like the principal. Here, all we have is a series of payments that is basically fixed into the future, no maturity, assuming they basically go on indefinitely because the corporation could live indefinitely. So if I was the present value, for example, using the rate, which would be the market rate, the 15% because the 12% was used just to calculate what the payments would be. And then comma, the number of periods we don't know because it goes on forever. So I'm just going to pick a large number because remember, as you get further and further out into the future, this dividend is going to be fairly small once we discount it back to the present value. So I'm just going to pick like 100 here, comma, number of period or the payment is going to be the $36 and that's going to give us our 240 getting us back to that 240. Let's try to map that out like we like we've seen with the bonds if I break it out on a year by year basis that we've seen up top year by year and we said for example $36 if I discount the $36 at the market rate 15% back one year it would get to the $31.30 about. So the rate here present value 15% number of periods one no payment because this is not an annuity comma comma therefore and the future value is 36 so if I did that all the way across for year two for example $36 discounted back two years at 15% 27 three years $36 discounted 15% uh, 23 and so on you can see it's going to get smaller and smaller all the way out and we, when we get close to 100 way out into the future it's a very small number and that's why even though it's kind of indefinite it goes on forever we could basically we can we can value it even though there's no maturity date and if i was to add up that series of payments we get to the 31.30 uh the the 240 i'm sorry we get to the 240 that we calculated here so it's just a, and so notice this is actually a little bit easier in some ways than valuing the bond because we don't have that maturity lump sum at the end, but it's a little bit more difficult at the same time because we don't have a maturity date. This goes on you know, indefinitely would be kind of the assumption. You could value this vertically doing the same kind of thing. So if I took the periods from one down to 100, I highly recommend, by the way, doing these kind of estimates in Excel because they allow you to visualize putting your table together this way. They allow you to visualize putting your table together this way. This is easier to copy and paste this stuff vertically, but the headers are a little bit more difficult. If you had long titles for your headers, you might have to use multiple cells or wrap the, wrap the cells. And then if we took our dividends at 36 and I present value them, now I'm present valuing, for example, the rate would be once again, the 15% number of periods is gonna be one pulled from here this time no payment comma comma and the future value would be 36 taking that 36 discounting it back one year to 31 and if i did that all the way down this way it would be easier for me to copy the cells down this way typically and then i can then get and sum this up and get back to that uh, 240. so again the preferred stock are actually a little bit easier in some ways to to calculate or estimate what's going to happen in the future than the common stock but the comments, so they're kind of more like the fixed income, but because they're kind of a hybrid type of thing, they're somewhat in the middle between fixed income and the common stock. Most of the time we default to, if I want fixed income, I go to bonds. If I want common, if I want equity investment, obviously I go to common stocks, 
but often sometimes you might want something like this depending on the returns for it particularly if you're in a situation where you want to live off the income meaning you're in like retirement for example or something like that and you're looking for other types of investments that have a fixed return that you can basically be living on the return similar to dividends for the equity side of things or on the fixed income side of things similar to the bonds possibly finding some investments that might have a higher return than than maybe bonds uh, depending on the circumstances